Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Dear listener, I hope you're managing to keep well in these highly charged times. Remember to look after yourself, spending time doing things that soothe you. Use the techniques you have to stay emotionally and mentally well. I'm going to link to a free app that I'm using for meditations, which I find really helpful. That will be in the show notes at scarletofthefay.com. Thank you for all your lovely emails. I've been in touch with some of you to discuss your own encounters and I really look forward to doing more of that in the coming months. You can contact me at scarletofthefay.com and find me at underscore remain underscore curious on Twitter and Instagram. The experiences that people share with me aren't always necessarily on the podcast. It's part of a wider project, the Modern Fairy Sightings Project. They form part of the wider research and I'm also writing a book. So if you feel that you'd like to share your story, but don't feel ready to share it on the podcast, then do get in touch. We've had lots more wonderful folks join the Curious Crew at Patreon. Thank you very much for all your generous and loving support. And a shout out to Claire and Gary, who've just joined at the Weird Folk tier. I really appreciate the rich discussion and the link sharing on our Discord channels. And I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of the new folk at our upcoming Zoom chat on 22nd of March. If you'd like to support the project and join a like-minded and open-hearted community, you can find us at patreon.com, the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. Or if you'd simply like to make a donation, you can find the podcast at Buy Me A Coffee. Thanks. Now, what you are about to listen to is utterly beautiful. It is a childhood experience of stepping into a place of wonder and yet feels very grounding. The experience led to a lifetime relationship with trees and it's an inspiring story, one which may bring you hope for healing and a better world. Enjoy. Where to start? Um, I've always been, I guess, um, very much a tree person. Um, as a little kid, I always used to run to my run to a tree in the backyard. Um, um, I am the youngest of five children, but I'm also the oldest of six children. So I'm the oldest, the youngest, in the middle. <laughs> oh, um, how how did that how does that work? You're the un- so, youngest. Well, my mum had four children before me, and then she met my father and had me, and then my father um, had six other children that I know of after me. So wow, I'm the that's lovely. <laughs> youngest, oldest, then <laughs> middle. Um, but um, on my mum's side, then that's who I grow with. Um, I'm the youngest. I'm the baby. Mm-hmm. So I was always a little bit of a loner, and I've always really liked trees. Um, whenever I was upset I'd go to a tree and sit under it and hug it um, and this started when I was really little. Being in a family of five um, mum was a single mum for a lot of the time Mm. and she decided that um, we lived in Auckland and not a very good area in Auckland and my brothers and sisters were getting into trouble so she decided to move us up to rural area And um, that was when I was eight years old. And the very first experience I had was um, I had a friend that her father was um, owned a fishing trawler and we would go out for three or four days and I was nine years old, I guess. And we'd be out there. And one of these trips, um, we, there was a great ball of, it looked like a second sun. Wow. And 
the, they were on the CB radio contacting everybody saying, hey, can you see this? What's going on? And it stayed in the sky for a very long time. And you could see the sun and you could also see this ball of light. Uh, it wasn't a ball of light, it was huge. It was like another sun. And within that trip, um, us kids were getting a bit antsy. There was three children on the boat and three adults. And we stopped off at a island, which is was a marine reserve, and you're not actually supposed to go on it. Mm. But um, they were, <laughs> as kids do, we were driving them crazy. So they dropped us off. We all hopped in a ding um, dinghy, us kids. Um, I was nine. My friend was nine, and her brother was 13. And um, we rode onto this island, um, which is a marine reserve, and no one else was around. Yeah. And we decided to play hide and seek. Um, so we all parted ways and I started walking up a hill. And I don't know, something kept on just drawing me up and up. And it was, as a kid, it was more of a sense of wonder about what was going on and just the beauty around me. I really appreciated coming from a city environment to a rural environment. And I really appreciated just being in the bush, seeing trees all around me, hearing birds, that sort of thing, um, and, and being by myself. Um, yeah. I wasn't scared. I just, I very much enjoyed wandering. So I got up to the top of the hill and um, the thing that struck me the most was how quiet everything was. I couldn't hear anything. Um, and everything seemed um super I guess um in focus but a bit blurry um I know that sounds really weird but everything seemed uh over heightened the mm. um everything just seemed more beautiful than it should I guess no I understand and, yeah yeah um and I came to a tree and I was not scared at all. I do not remember fear. I remember just being in awe and just really um, probably um, just grateful for being there. And this tree, around this tree, there were three other beings. And there was um, a wee little fairy, kind of like a little ball of light, um, a little brown man, and uh, I thought of him as like a, uh, if you think of the Lord of the Rings, like an elf type thing, but he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty just white. Um, and um, as I've probably said, the Māori have a legend here, they call them um, Patapairehi. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the, the fairies, the beings, otherworldly beings, they were here before the Māori. Um, and it just seems to me as I've gotten older, I recognise that more than the probably the Lord of the Rings elf. Um, yeah. And I seem to have sort of, they seem to have been waiting for me, but it just feels like mm -hmm. being presumptuous that they were waiting for me. I guess if anyone had turned up, they would have just been waiting for them. And the tree itself, it was, uh, all I can say, it was the centre. Um, the, the, it was sentient. It was truly amazing. Um, and as a nine-year-old child, um, it just sort of, I didn't find it weird or different or I just found it amazing or scary. Definitely didn't find it scary. And I was part of a conversation, and for the life of me, is um, I really can't. I know I, I promised I would do something as a nine-year-old. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and I can't really remember what it was I promised. Um, I have a feeling I sort of know, um, but nothing sort of concrete. And I've asked, and... I haven't really had anything mm. 
but the thing to me out of all of those the three beings it was the tree that that um probably drew me in the most yeah what kind of tree was it I had no idea it was huge it was green um massive leaves it had interwoven branches whenever I think about I always think of that if you know the the tree of creation yeah the tree of life yeah that's it that's what it reminds me of wow yeah and that's what spoke to me the others didn't okay yes what so so when you were having the conversation it was with the tree itself yeah Yeah. definitely and what do you what do you feel it might have been that it was asking I think I think to myself that it was asking me to um, have a place of safety for them, have a place for them to go, not particularly them, but say the trees mm. um, have a, as a kid, I've always wanted in, in a farm, um, not for animals so much, but to have trees all around me. I find I find being in a forest is much more, relaxing to me than being by the beach or being up a mountain or anything like that being in a forest is my thing I I love walking in them I love just sitting in them and yeah I if I you know and and it came true as I um, got older I um, moved from Auckland and um, got myself a 28 acre farm and and planting (laughs) Oh, wow. Because I was just going to say, what is it that you love doing? And have you kind of managed to to fit that with your with your life? And it sounds like you've absolutely you've absolutely done that then. Healing has helped me many times in my life when I'd reached a point where something needed to change. In 2005, I trained with Martin Broffman to learn the body mirror system of healing which was life-changing for me. It's based on the idea that the parts of your body that don't work well reflect the parts of your life that don't work well and about which you have tension in your consciousness. The understanding is that tension is stress and stress causes symptoms. In a distance healing or in-person session, I move up the chakras, returning each one to wholeness using a colour map. During the process, I see images and situations, I hear words or receive impressions that tell me something about what caused the tension in that person's life. The feedback at the end of the session is a really big part of the healing. If you're interested in a chakra healing session, you can contact me at scarletofthefay at gmail.com. Yeah, I I feel... um... But I, feel, I still feel like there's there's something more, and and to be honest, and I've had a lot of a lot of other encounters of the same sort of not that sort of thing, but other things. Mm. Um, and it to be really honest, listening to your podcast, I never thought about thinking about how it affected me or how. Um, were those ages relevant Um, and Mm. I actually find that they are every time I've had an encounter it's been an age that I'm a nine person my name's a nine my address is a nine my birth year is a nine and all these happen all these things happen on my nine years Mm, that's interesting and and also that's you know nine is is often about it's a shift isn't it it's a cycle the end of a cycle in numerology anyway yes once you get to yeah right it's like a threshold isn't it yeah and, wow um, okay mm. so I do remember sitting there uh, just actually standing there and talking and um I do have the closest um recollection of the tree and also the brown man yeah <laughs> so brown man what was he like um, he was little he had a beard he was um he didn't he he was yeah actually he was quite old that time I saw him um he looked very ancient 
he looked like a gnarled wood um, with hair and um, a hat, and he was all in brown. Mm. Um, and he kind of had a cheeky grin on his face. Mm. Mm. Um, and he watched. Um, and I think he, I, I have a vague recognition of him actually speaking, like reinforcing what the tree was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know whether he was part of it or he was, it was like a gathering of um, all bits and pieces of our land. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um and they just wanted to impart to to reinforce that um you know I guess nature was speaking yeah um I've encountered him a couple of times after that not specifically him um but I don't know his race his his essence I'm not too sure Mm -hmm. that kind of being yeah, definitely that kind of being. They, and how how has that gone when when you've seen him since? Um, well, the last time I saw him, um, was I was with my uh, partner at the time, and we were driving home, and we came to a place which is well known for like uh, Scottish heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a Ute in front of me, or um, I don't know if you know what I mean by a Ute, um, a truck with yeah. a. Uh, yeah okay cool um and he was different he wasn't brown he had green on kind of reminded me of a leprechaun right Um, and he I was I was not driving at the time I was sitting um just staring around there were a lot of cornfields around us and um he came out of the back of the ute um trail of it he didn't even look at me but I saw him and he um, hopped out, jumped onto the, and we were going 100 kilometers an hour. He jumped out to the side and wandered into the cornfields. <sighs> and I just went, I turned to my partner at the time and I went, oh my God, did you see that? Yeah. And he, he refused to answer me. Now, okay. Um, wow, okay. I, <laughs> he refused, he, he wouldn't talk about it at all. <laughs> at all. Now he is, I'm, I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not technically a religious person. I don't follow any religions and I've, I've looked at lots of them, mm. uh, but he was quite a hardcore Christian. Right. Um, and I don't know whether that had anything to do with that, mm. but that was it. He didn't, the, the, the being didn't turn around and look at me. He didn't even acknowledge anything at all. Yeah. He just climbed on out and he looked younger and he was wearing green um, rather than brown yeah um he was probably I don't know um 20 inches tall maybe that about the same as the other one as well is that about 20 yeah. inches tall yeah. yeah um and he just hopped off the ute going 100k landed on his feet didn't roll or anything and walked into the cornfield and I just was like what how how did that even happen and I I remember coming home and just saying to my nieces and nephews oh my goodness I've seen a leprechaun and one of my nieces turned around to me and said I believe you auntie Mm, yeah (laughs) and I went thank you um and my sister well my family know I'm a little bit crazy anyway and they just went oh okay but my partner at the time he didn't he didn't back me up. He didn't. He didn't. Just didn't say anything, and I couldn't get anything else out of him. It's so hard, isn't it? It's like we, you know, we just come to accept and laugh off um, the, the, you know, the people around us that love us, but just, you know, can't understand. It's just they just can't understand, and it's hard. And then for that, for for it to be your partner as well, and you've literally just seen something together and you know for them they're just having a really hard time in processing that and and for them it just does not compute they can't marry it with anything that they 
align to and and oh my goodness if they did then you know their their whole life's understanding of of life in the world as it is would just shatter into pieces and therefore it's just like does not compute and I am not acknowledging that that just happened (laughs) yeah and and it was exactly it was just blanking me and there was no acknowledgement of what I said even um Mm -hmm. or just oh shush be quiet you don't know what you're talking about nothing that it was just dead quiet and he'd just not say anything so I thought for a little while was did I honestly see that did I am I yeah but then I believe my intuition a lot more than you Mm. know I trust myself more than some people (laughs) yes we it's very important to do to trust your intuition you know we are you know in some in some ways we well like animals we we know yeah we have a strong intuition and of course it's kind of indoctrinated you know out of us really isn't it to not trust to trust what 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 we're told and and um from external sources but but we know and you we know when you see it yourself and actually his response um i guess even though he didn't acknowledge to you what he'd seen did did he seem in shock was he did we honestly after, while we were driving he just no words I must have been in a little dream and I knew I know I wasn't asleep yeah um and I was just looking around and there was like shocked silence I know I was shocked yeah because not the fact that I not the fact that I'd seen something the fact that it was so the being was so nonchalant about it yeah didn't even acknowledge anything had to have known there was a car behind yeah had to have known that there were people driving it but it was like it didn't either one it didn't expect me to uh, us to see it or two it didn't care yeah it really didn't care yeah that's really Um, funny yeah it just it really blew me away that one out of all of the bits and pieces that I've seen that one blew me away the most and I don't know why because I think it was just um one I had someone with me yeah two was bright daylight yeah and I don't I think I think there's I'm a very much of a science fiction fantasy person right so I have read a lot um because of the things that I saw when I was younger it made me really interested Mm. so I find it it possibly at that point I was look I'm 50 now Mm. that point I was 36 years old (laughs) I hadn't really seen anything for a little while before that and it just came out of the blue yeah just completely out of the blue and um I was shocked but I was so happy to have someone else to see it and because he didn't acknowledge it it was a shock to me also Mm. but again you know 36 that's my nine number again yeah we we broke up not long after oh yeah I was wondering yeah oh goodness and it's 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 a shame isn't it because that's something could have shared together and I wonder how I wonder how they feel about it now I don't know I find and I find with in me and myself that I just these amazing things that happen but you just brush them to one side if one you don't understand them or two it's just your life gets so busy Mm. and I don't even know whether he would ever think about it Mm. I think it might have just been a glitch for him and then he moved on yeah yeah which I find is sad for him but that's his choice yeah for me it was like wow that's you cheeky Cheeky yeah. bugger, <laughs> but um, not yeah. him, but the, that being, I was just the like, being. wow, yeah, Dude, that was just really amazing. And I was so happy to just see that. Yeah. Really, really happy. Well, it's, um, you know, it's another kind of confirmation as well or validation of, you know, what's gone before. And, you know, we think, oh, well, we've seen things when we're children that's when we're children but there you are sort of 36 going you know minding your own business going down a road and then 
and then that happens. It's, it's really funny to think that um, they might be hopping in and out of vehicles and, you know, grabbing lifts down the road to places as well. I wonder exactly. where that had come from. <laughs> Well, that, that's exactly right. And that's why. And the thing is, I never even thought about it either until um, I'd say, listen to some of your other podcasts. I never thought to actually uh, research it, think about it. Why Why might I have seen that being there? Well, one, um, I know a leprechaun is Irish, <laughs> but it, that sort mm. of little man, I, I sort of think to myself, OK, it's a very Scottish area that I was in, like highly Scottish mm, that's interesting um, yeah was it was he going to meet and see this one was young very mm. young um he seemed not like the brown man that I saw because he was old um, yeah ancient and this one was young and I'm like are the young ones now deciding that they can travel faster <laughs> hitching a ride seriously yeah. I'm like, do they evolve that way it's um, true, isn't it? Yeah. Are they catching buses? Are they kind of yeah. hopping onto buses? And <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And I mean, it'd be quite easy to um, hop on the back of a ute, an open back yeah. ute, and jumping out afterwards. And if you know you're not going to hurt yourself. Um, yeah. Well, that makes me think of carriages back in yeah. the day as well. Would they have done the same with carriages? Just yeah, like sitting on the back. Trailer. Having mm. a, yeah. So um, that was because I always thought my own, um, I think you make judgments when you read a lot and stuff. And I thought, I, are they allowed to touch iron? Are they allowed to touch metal? Mm. All that sort of thing. Yeah. This one had no problem. <laughs> Definitely yes. had no problem. So yeah. do they yeah. evolve with while we evolve? Is that exactly. a possibility? I just don't know. But That's a yeah, really good that question. Was, um so with the first man um so you said he was wearing browns I know it's a, a long time ago so it might be hard to remember but can you remember anything any more about him like um maybe what he was wearing or even his eyes and whether he was wearing yeah. any other clothes they were green mm. um he was he was all in brown and he had big brown it's kind of even I don't know if it was, I was going to say velvet, but it's not. It's more the, not even leather. Um, I don't know. I'm not really a material person. As in, Suede? Could be. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't, definitely wasn't velvet, but it was like a softer, and they had big brown buttons. I remember that. Mm. And um, um, baggier brown pants. Um, but I just remember he was all brown. And I can't even remember if he had shoes on or not. Mm. But he definitely had a brown hat on, like a, I always sort of think of it like a Santa hat without the pom-pom and brown. Mm. Because I have to admit, when I saw that picture of, of a modern fairy, um, your, uh, your thing, it, it spooked me. Yeah. Because I thought, yeah. wow, um, someone else has seen him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that, that picture was drawn by my husband uh, from me describing the man that I'd seen. Although I have to say the man in that picture is a lot more smiley than the one yes. I saw. He Mine wasn't smiling like that, but his being was uh, sort of evoking that kind of disposition if you like it wasn't like cheeky. he wasn't smiling at me but yeah well, he was yeah. really curious he was looking at yeah. me but it was quite cheeky the way he turned up because he was already watching us before I spotted him um, and he was really interested and he had I, I got a really lovely sense from him but I wouldn't say that he was smiling at me but his eyes were just so well his whole face was open oh. and um and his eyes were really sparkly and, and looking right into mine. So I was trying to describe what I was saying to my husband, um, you know, was that he had like a friendly face and, um, and his face was just so, so ancient. And he did a really good job of producing something which is very close to, to what I saw the open face, the roundness of the features, the sparkly eyes, the, 
you know, the lines, line upon line upon line on his face. So yeah, that that's what that picture is based on. So it sounds like we saw something very similar. Yeah, I always liked that he reminded me of a tree trunk. Mm. And not, <laughs> not that he looked wooden, but he had so many lines on his face. And um, um, I sort of relate that to um, like the, it's not even bark, but just the ancientness of trees. Yeah. Of that. Um, it's a good point, actually, because, I mean, when I saw mine, I can never remember if he was just in front or just behind. I think he must have just I really I'm really, you know, struggling to remember whether he was just in front or just behind. But he was ne- next to a fallen log. And, uh, you know, was the was the log anything to do with him? I don't know. Hmm? I don't know. But um, but you feel that yours was related to the tree. Yeah, like an extension. Mm. Very much. Um yeah one being but like an extension like uh, I don't like know a, like personification of tree or place yeah um yeah absolutely yeah yeah that's right um I don't know whether it had anything to do with the um the that big ball of light in the sky well that's right so oh there's so much to talk about here so at what point in the trip did the ball of light appear and at what time of day? It was um, the second day, because I remember it quite clearly, because this has happened to me twice now, mm. um, quite clearly. And uh, it was uh, later, maybe mid-afternoon. Um, mm. And I know uh, the, these are seasoned fisher people, people fisherman fish, um, and his wife. So they don't get spooked easily. Yeah, um, but they were spooked. Uh, you could tell that they were spooked, and they were radioing all the other fi- um, fishing boats around, um, saying, "Hey, can you see this? Do you know what it is?" Um, and the other and fisher re- boats could see it too. Yeah, and I remember it was the next day that we went to the island. Yeah. So I don't know if that was the case but I do know as a kid as a nine-year-old it didn't worry me it was pretty cool it looked awesome Mm. but I know they were they were spooked yeah Um, Tao went out so a bit worried did it just remain there how long a couple of hours and then what happened I don't remember Mm. that's the thing I have no idea yeah Um, yeah. I don't know whether we were sent to bed yeah Um, I don't remember. Um, I just remember that. Um, and and the, the adults being worried. So it was as big as the sun. And where was it in the sky? Was it kind of on the horizon or up in the sky? Uh, above the horizon. Um, not in the middle of the sky, but say um, halfway between the middle and the horizon, just sitting there. Mm. Um, so it wasn't a optical illusion or anything like that um it was it was interesting I thought it was pretty pretty awesome um the other kids we weren't the kids weren't worried about it the adults were really worried about it Mm. yeah did you get a feeling of it at all just again this probably the same sort of feeling I got when I went into the island and walked up the hill just awe just wow that's pretty cool and yeah not scared of it at all the thing is when you're a kid as well you know everything's new maybe the first time you see a mountain or the first time you see you know a, a, a well you could have you could have seen a whale and maybe had mm. the same kind of awe experience yeah. because it's part of nature and it just you know everything is part of nature mm-hmm. where where was it in relation to the sun the sun was the other side, uh, maybe up higher, um, yeah. maybe mid in, in the sky. So it must have been mid-afternoon mm. or early afternoon. And so then, I, can't, I can't see why they would have sent us to bed early, but I don't recall what happened. Do you stay in touch with the kids that, that you were with? I wonder if they still um, think about it. The, um, one of the <laughs> – it's really funny, actually – the 
my friend who was nine two um yes i i've talked to her a couple of times about it and she's a real skeptic um and she doesn't believe in anything like that so she doesn't really she just says meh now her brother unfortunately passed away when he was 20 so oh dear I, yeah that that was just us three kids on there and the mm. adults all the adults have passed away yeah so she remembers it but she she doesn't speak of it or she she remembers it but she dismisses it yeah she remembers it she dismisses it um she also remembers us going onto the island and um playing hide and seek and they couldn't find me they looked mm. everywhere there's only a small island um and they couldn't find me anywhere um and I just wanted then I heard them calling for me because I was sounding a bit scared um apparently they've been looking for about half an hour okay and um I heard them calling and I just sort of said goodbye and wandered down the hill to them yeah and would you have said the time that you spent there that that felt about right about half an hour um to be honest I'm not too sure mm, but yeah what about and um, did you tell them when you saw them? No, I never told anybody. Um, I don't know why. I just didn't tell anyone. But um, one of my other friends, funnily enough, um, when I got a little bit older, I think I was about 13, I was very much, my me and my friend um, were very much into meditation and spirituality and stuff. I had from ever since that at that time, um, one of the biggest things I know, I always, after that time, talked to trees. Mm -hmm. Always. My mum would catch me going up to a tree and having a chat. <laughs> That's um, lovely. When I was that age, I had a good friend. I felt was a really good friend. It was a tree. It was a mm -hmm. putakawa down at the beach. And I used to spend hours and hours laying, laying on it, on him, I called him, and um, listening to his heartbeat and just chatting to him. Oh, that's so lovely. How old were you then? Um, so from the age when I got back, um, from the age of nine onwards, till probably about sixteen. <laughs> um, I was that's a strange so kid. <laughs> no, that's that's just so beautiful. And I'm just thinking now that you've surrounded your, yourself with all of these tree friends as well, in you know, in where you're living, and how okay. how just wonderful that must be to just live the way that you really truly want to live that is the most uh the deepest reflection of of who you are and your connection with this world and and your your relationship with trees I just think that is just so beautiful yeah well I, I love trees I don't I don't know all their names um I don't know the best places to plant them but I try and plant them whenever I can um and look after them and I'm always very upset if any of them die or are knocked over by an animal because I have horses on the property mm. I've um fenced off all the forest areas so they can't get into it into it so it can just be you know grow naturally and and not disturbed yeah but it's good it's you know part of life isn't it it's going to happen sometimes and yeah so I imagine you know you've got a, a working farm and are there situations in your area where you felt called upon to um, protect land, other landscapes? Um, I, I've, um, I've, I've helped out, but no, I'm, I'm very much a. Um, I think the word would have been. I probably in in another life I would have been a hermit in my cave. I love being alone. I love being in nature. Um, people drain me quite a lot. Mm. um so I tend to stick to my own company or people that I know won't drain me um mm. I'm very insular I guess I love being at home I don't particularly got, like going anywhere else I do like traveling I've traveled um quite extensively but I love being home my home is I wouldn't even say my safe place it just feels like my home I love it yeah it's where you want to be yeah and when you travel, um, how do you find relating to trees wherever you are? If you if you try to, I find I go to trees all the time. Yeah, uh, you'll find me either with a tree or with an animal. 
Yeah. So um, it's just calming for me, really, really calming. And I guess it it um, um, helps, I guess, steady my nerves. And I know that like an animal in a tree, they don't judge. They just sit and listen and, and accept love and give love type thing. Yeah, that's really true. I, I um, As a group, we used to practice going to a place where there were uh, trees and we would we would feel attracted to a certain tree and then we would sit beneath it or stand beneath it with our backs against the tree and just connect in and um, there'd be the old creek and things like this so you would it's like you would uh, begin a, a diet and in a dialogue um, yeah. and connect with that tree and if you can meditate where you go sort of into the the trunk and down into the roots um and just have this deep conversation with the tree if you like um it was a really peaceful grounding exercise um but something i haven't done regularly which you know i would like to do again yeah. is that how, how do you begin the conversation or the relation with any tree uh, hand on the tree, hand on my heart, and just share, I guess, that energy. Mm. And that's how I start. That's how I always start. Um, when I was younger, I said I would always be really polite to trees. <laughs> I would say thank you and sorry if I accidentally hit it or um, mm. um, and just how are you today? Um that sort of thing. I don't recall any of them really chatting back to me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, not, not just. I say normal, not just the normal trees around me. Um, but I had always, I guess, felt energy, and I was always extremely polite. Even now, I tell. Um, I have a fourteen-year-old stepson, and I tell him, "Don't do that to a tree. Don't break a branch off. Don't." Um, if you're going to climb a tree, be careful where you climb. You don't want to break things. It's like someone taking off a finger off yeah. your home. That yeah, sort of thing. I agree um, that there's a park near me that, you know, I walk by, you know, it's right next to our home. And um, and I walk through it. There's a little children's play park, which I take our daughter to. And then, um, you know, there were these two boys as I was walking through the park and they were just, they were hanging on the branches, which is fair enough. But then they were kind of try actively trying to sort of rip uh, one of the branches off. And I and their mo their mothers were stood there, completely ignoring what they were doing. So I I kind of took a detour nearer to the park where it's sort of fenced off, and I just said to them, "Don't hurt the tree, don't hurt yeah. the tree." You know, like I you know smiled at them, yeah. um, and they kind of looked at me, and um, they did actually stop. They must have thought oh is that a weird woman but they did they did actually stop I just yeah it hurt I it hurts me to see that happening um and there's another tree nearby where kids keep tearing lower branches off and I thought of hanging a sign on it saying please don't hurt this tree uh, so, I'm exactly the same I do the same thing I see kids I will say that to them don't hurt a tree what have they done to you they're just they're living doing the best that they can and it's like you knock them over just for the fun of it but yeah I've <laughs> I'm yeah strange I, I've always been like that ever since that encounter I've always loved trees but I've never talked to them in that sort of way and ever since that encounter every tree I, I sort of talk to or I've got some uh, one in my driveway I'll go up to it and I'll put my hand on it and I say how are you today and that sort of thing mm. and, mm. and I do it around people that I don't really know because I'm just like well it's me you've got to get used to me anyway um yeah. if you're someone that'll stick around then you'll stick around um it's a good test yeah well I don't even to be honest I don't care if they don't yeah it's just who I am yeah but yeah um I don't know whether you want to hear the second time I saw that light I would love to and can I just ask you first also um yeah there was another being at the the tree so there was a, a sort of a ball of light did you say and then another kind of yes. fairy so yes. what what can you describe those it was white 
um, very white, um, almost glowing white, um, white clothes on, um, tall, um, not overly tall, but as a nine-year-old taller than me and the other two because they were quite short, mm. uh, had blue eyes, blue or green, I don't know. I think they were blue eyes. Mm. And he had a straight nose and caught um a longish nose um yeah. and he had i'm trying to think now possibly white hair mm -hmm. um but i don't with him because i didn't take a lot of notice of him mm -hmm. and to be honest you would think as a nine-year-old i would have taken a lot of notice of the fairy too mm -hmm. like the tinkerbell fairy but I didn't. I was so engrossed with the tree and so engrossed with um, the cheeky smile on the brown man's face mm. and the little brown man, the little wee man. Um, I didn't, I, they were just part of it, but, but um, on the edges. Yeah. It's so beautiful because these, you know, we don't know, do we? But it, they just feel like these aspects of, of pure nature. And, you know, they obviously, in this situation, they've come together. And of course, you're resonating more with the tree and potentially its um, personification, the um, the little man or something yeah. about that little man, which sounds very earthy. And yes. that's what I what kind of resonated with as well when I was in that place where we saw him um, and you know these other beings maybe they were different aspects of nature maybe the air maybe they were more kind of an air being or you know wh whatever else was around and you know I just this nature reserve this um, island was obviously so untouched by human beings and to think that this is the true essence of the world and we've you know come in and affected everything to such a degree that you know we've maybe removed a lot of this a lot of this life you know these fairy beings by our treatment of the world but just to think that this was it does sound like paradise doesn't it really you know you go to this place and the earth is fully um, you know, and this was going back some time as well. Uh, the earth was whole and healthy, and maybe this is what how we related to the earth at some point in the past. I, I just, I'm just wondering about that. I think so, and I also think that um, the time that I was there was like a bubble. It was like mm. the air, yeah. air seemed fresher. The, the colors seemed brighter. The kind of has a dream like but a real sharp um definitive look to it in my head when I think back to it yeah because as yeah. I said I, I never told anybody never told anybody at all until I was about 13 and my my friend's mother was a psychic and she did readings and um my mum I, I was very I don't know quite spiritual then mm. um and we would have meditation groups and all sorts of things. And I mean, between the ages of, you know, I was only 13 at the yeah. time. Um, and and so she offered to do a reading for me. And I brought my mum in with me, who wasn't, who was spiritual, but wasn't really into what I was into. And that's when it came up. Um, she said, oh, I just, she said to me, while I was sitting in there with my mum she goes um I can see this scene blah 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 and I burst into tears and I said how did you know about that oh. I had not told anybody yeah and so that was I've told three people in my life <laughs> oh wow gosh and so my mum heard it from the reading that I had with um and my friend's um, mother who was a psychic and only recently two other people and what did your mum say um, mum was really blown away after that she went to the meditation groups that I went to and she mm. was into it um, for a long time afterwards also um, but mum's passed away so some of these things I can't even I know they've happened but I can't talk to anybody that knows yeah I yeah 
Yeah, I understand. That's so lovely that you were able to share it with your mom. I'm so glad that you were able to do that. You know, you obviously, you came into the world and she was obviously, a, <laughs> you know, the, the mechanism in which you entered this world. And then to be able to, to share that, that with her, um, right. your relationship with this world, and then be able to tell her about that is just so precious. So I'm so glad so, you were able to. Yeah, no, she's, um, so in some ways, I guess it was the child leading the adult in that side for my mum. She hadn't kind of found what she needed and and because I was into it, I brought her into it and that yeah. was what she needed at the time. And and she was, I don't think we even went in with um, the lady that was giving me the reading. She didn't go into great depth she just said this is what happened when you were this age and um because I kind of put it aside mm. it was there yeah. but I didn't talk to anyone it was I couldn't even say it was that precious um little um gem that I didn't want to share with them anybody I didn't feel like I could share mm. with anybody mm. uh, and it just sort of faded into the background um, which I find a lot of these things do when you get on with normal life you have these experiences and then they're they stay there for a little while and then they just fade until something brings it back up again yeah yeah that's very true and also when you're, when you're talking about this kind of vibrancy and the experience that's very indicative of an altered state so I've experienced that too when often when we're walking around, we're kind of seeing the world through a certain bubble of perception. And it's very mundane. It's what we're used to. If we meditate and raise our vibration mm -hmm. um, or have a healing and, you know, then open our eyes afterwards, we can literally, we're, it, we're seeing the world through a different bubble and, and colors can seem much brighter um so yeah I, I've also experienced that before and it is part of this altered state seeing it's like seeing the world as it truly is in fact without our kind of earthly maybe fears and doubts and and um yeah yeah definitely again it's that thing that you have these um experiences and you don't well personally I don't sit back and think about it I just have the experience and then I move on yeah and to be honest it's only through your podcast that I've gone hang on a second um what happened then how mm. old was I then that yeah. sort of thing so I really thank you for that because I just I don't know why because I'm quite an, an inquiring person I wouldn't know why I wouldn't think about it but it's just put in the back of my head and I've just moved on with my life Oh, that's so good to hear. That is what it's all about. I think, you know, many of us, so, so many of us, there's a great number of people. This isn't something that's rare, I think. From speaking to people, most people have had an unusual experience that they can't explain. And many of those are fairy experiences or these other experiences like lights in the sky, lights in our homes. We're just encouraged not to talk about it so it's so that's that's great that it helps you to you know feel able Proceed. to yeah 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 to to look at it and you know and and maybe even talk about it because this is what life's about surely <laughs> well absolutely because I went with my experience with the um I keep on going to call I know he's not a leprechaun but he was all in green um and I thought to myself um do I subconsciously um clothe him in what he looks like because the area that I'm in um or is that his who who that being is do you understand what I mean yeah because yeah. I was a very it's a very um Scottish area and I know um and they have similar sort of beings did he manifest as that because of the area I was in, because of the collective, uh, I don't memories of that area. Yeah. And the folklore. That sort of person. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think um, in the episode, I think it's episode five off the top of my head, Crossing Paths anyway, it's called, um, a woman was wondering about the same same thing. That was also in a place where a lot of um, Irish immigrants had settled. And so there was this idea that maybe, you know, we bring with us our beliefs and folklore and that they come as physical manifestations, you know, literally on board or um, sort of spiritual uh, manifestations within our own thoughts and consciousness so you know it's something to think about really isn't it because it's what what do we know <laughs> we we just don't know but um on that kind of level that would make sense wouldn't it but wow so with that first experience I you know I usually ask people if there was a shift afterwards and it sounds as if it was this move towards just really relating to trees in a in a in an even deeper way Mm -hmm. would you say there was anything else that happened as a result of that um just that put me in the path I guess of um spirituality more I was um mum as kids we she she was a very spiritual woman but she was very much into um exploring religions so she would take us kids with up here which was great for us it, it, it broadened our horizons yeah. i'm very open when i meet people um because of what she did when we were younger we we mixed with so many different people and met so many different um religions and spirituality and that sort of thing that i'm i'm open to anything so I went more the spiritual way, probably. Um, I always had, a, I guess, I always had a problem just from me with the, with some religions. I was very much a questioner and I, <laughs> that's not appreciated in some of them. Um, mm-hmm. And so I found that I would rather do my own research than being told yeah what was this and what was that and that was from the age of nine and that is also to be honest the age where I really got into reading Mm. before that I was not interested in reading and I found it difficult I found it boring um but I then got into reading and I loved it I haven't stopped I haven't stopped since it sounds like you know as often with with these sorts of encounters maybe a healing took place which also um corresponds with this uh sense of seeing everything as brighter and more vibrant it's like the thing is with the healing when i talk about healing it's it's a process whereby you become more like yourself your your true self your deep self and so all of the things that have happened in your life that have caused tension or all of the other kind of earthly situations and emotions that we deal with when we heal from those when when we realign to our true selves this is what i'm saying you see things as they truly are and you feel things as they truly are and actually the world is a really beautiful place and that life is a beautiful experience um you know when we're not suffering um, which is why healing is so important so it sounds as if um you know possibly one way to look at it uh is that you had this this meeting and um and it kind of got you back to to who you are and maybe reading was part of that I think so I love reading Uh, the biggest thing that I probably didn't um after that I got a lot of deja vu Mm. I was constantly living with deja vu as a kid um knowing what someone was going to say um reliving the same event um and that sort of thing and as I got older um and it was daily it was really it was like I was living two different lives Mm -hmm. um and then as I got older they started to become less and less until probably my 30s they sort of disappeared altogether okay yeah so it's kind of, I guess, that opened a lot of options for me. And I guess where I'm going with the deja vu is that there were so many places that I could have gone, um, so many choices I could have made that should, would have changed my life. Mm. As a youngster, I was just remembering 
I don't know, maybe things that maybe I was showing things there. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That there's this idea of that. And I and I, you know, I hope to talk more about about these experiences um, in this series because it's something I'm really drawn to lately, uh, thinking about my own childhood experiences, thinking, you know, hearing other people's encounters. It's really brought home a lot of a lot of stuff and and um and I want to understand more about that you know from from speaking to other researchers there's this idea that potentially when young young children have experiences they are taught things they are given knowledge that is going to have you know something to do with their life purpose and so yeah I want to look into this more because it does seem like that's what happens a lot of the time Mm, that only just came to me <laughs> while I was talking to you and I was thinking actually yes I remember having lots of deja vu after that constantly um until I got to a certain point in my life and then it stopped yeah yeah and I just wonder also because you were saying you're not quite sure exactly what what the full purpose is and um now that you have this space this environment where you have been tending these trees with a lot of love and care do you think that that potentially could lead to teaching other people to to live in this way because although you you said you prefer to kind of you know (laughs) enjoy your own company if you're now able to talk about these things which you are doing here and I feel really honored that you've been open to speak to me about this I just wonder whether it might mark a a transition where you're able to to share this this kind of this knowledge and this wisdom that you've you've gathered in in speaking with trees and connecting with trees that's something that you could potentially share or does that just sound like you know does that immediately feel like oh no I could never ever do that I would prefer to sort of you know be in that space I have, um, I guess, thought about that, um, and the the job that I'm in at the moment is um, none of the jobs that I've been in have satisfied me. They've they've mm. brought me to a certain point um, where monetary um, is good, you know, money's good, but I'm not satisfied. And now that I have land, and I I can. I would love to be able to build a retreat for people. Yeah, that's... You make it um, very down to earth and and um, close to nature. And I know it's possibly in the future if that's the way it goes. And I walk past certain parts of my property and go, oh, yeah, that would be perfect to put that hole there. Uh, that would be perfect to put a little cabin there so they can spend time there. Um, oh, that's perfect. So, yeah. it's really... Whether it happens or not, it's something that is a goal and something that I'd like to do. Mm. Um, so I will see how it pans out, I guess. Uh, it's, it's music to my ears, actually, to hear this, because as you're talking about it, I can really feel it in my heart. And, I, and what I'm feeling is that you're creating this for, because it's something that you would have loved to have had access to in the past because you know what that feels like and there are so many of us you know that would hear that and think oh I would absolutely love to go to a retreat like this so you are creating it you you, you're doing it from the heart because you know what needs to be in place to give people that space and that connection with with environment and with the trees and with the earth in a in a place that you have created so it's just come full circle you know if that comes to fruition like that and that's um that's really amazing I walk past the certain places and I can almost hear the people laughing and um enjoying themselves and and music and talking and and I guess you build it up in your mind and think about it and dream about it so much that it makes it happen it does yeah so that's what I'm trying to do anyway. Oh, lovely. It's all manifesting. It's manifesting itself into being. I love that. Well, thank you very much. It's so wonderful to hear these encounters. And um, like you, I really love 
that that one of the, the guy, the little gnome or pixie or whatever he was, leprechaun jumping out of the back of that ute and running off. And I love that. <laughs> So, I, I do it puts a so smile much. on my face every time I think about it <laughs> yeah because that's their nature they're just so cheeky I, I really recognize that now that you know that is a kind of aspect of, of those particular beings they're really cheeky and I love that I, I warm to that <laughs> yeah thank you Jess. thank you thank so you. much for making it possible for me to talk about this Oh, I really appreciate, you know, you being open to, to doing this and for, for speaking. And I, yeah, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. And, and I'm sure lots of people listening will really resonate with what you've said as well. So thank you very much. And I really wish you all the best with your plans with your land as well. And it sounds idyllic. Time to This was a particularly beautiful share and very much moved me to hear it. I'm sure many of you feel the same. Huge thanks to our guest for being willing to share her story. Fairies are well known to be connected with trees. The traditional fairy tree is of course the hawthorn. In Ireland, where fairy belief is still honoured to the present day, local authorities are often petitioned to protect hawthorns which lie in the way of new roads or building plans though it must be said that these actions are in the most part fuelled by the fear of the consequences from the fairies if their paths and trees are removed. There are plenty of examples in the past decade or so of developers who've learned the hard way. I've shared links to some examples of these on the show notes. But some believe that each tree, flower or herb has a particular nature spirit or fairy being which takes care of it, known sometimes as dryads. Some believe that they could be a spiritual embodiment of that tree appearing as a physical looking spiritual being. Present at the ancient tree for our guest were a gnome, an elf and a smaller winged fairy being. Though our guest describes noticing the gnome, her conversation was mostly with the tree itself. It sounds like she was communing directly with nature. And as I say, I do wonder whether this is our natural state. Here, an innocent child, so open to the world and all its mysteries. She trusts her instinct to climb up the hill on the island, towards this meeting, as if it were predestined. From this conversation she agrees to do something, we don't know what, but it feels possible that it was something about taking care of nature, or more specifically, trees, and maybe that's something she can also teach others. More and more I'm sensing that these childhood experiences are often about forming a link with the other world as part of a pre-agreed duty to realise whatever they are meant to do in this lifetime. Have you tried conversing with a tree? It's a simple exercise. It's nice to do it with a tree that you're familiar with, but equally, if you're somewhere you're unfamiliar with, then just quietly walk around until you feel drawn to a certain tree. You don't need to know what type of tree it is. Just trust your sense of connection. Then stand or sit beneath with your back against the trunk and open to a conversation in your mind. Start as you would with any conversation by introducing yourself and maybe why you are there. If you feel you need help or direction, then ask for it. Then go inside yourself and quieten your mind. Concentrate on your breathing and the sounds of nature that surround you. Notice how the wind might rustle the leaves and move the branches. During the conversation, you may notice the tree creaking in response. Go with it. Don't try to rationalise or question, as that's just the mind kicking in. We don't need the mind for this exercise. Listen with heart and spirit, and trust whatever you receive. It may or may not be a huge event the first time, but it's something that you can build upon. You can also do the exercise with a group of people, but each head to your own tree, and afterwards you can exchange your experience with each other if it feels right. The two suns phenomenon experienced by our guest is also very interesting. The first event took place on the fishing boat, and she had a later one that was witnessed along with five of her cousins. If you'd like to hear that part of the conversation, you can join the Curious Crew at patreon.com 
Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. There's a meteorological phenomenon known as sun dog, parhelion, or mock sun, which creates a bright spot to one or both sides of the sun. It's caused by the light refraction of ice crystals in the atmosphere. They can cause anything from rainbow-coloured prisms to full white or yellow sun-like images in the sky. On the show notes, I've shared an amazing example that looks like a portal. However, our guest maintains she saw something quite different to any of those images. She says it was a ball of fire in the sky which she could look directly at. If you have experienced something similar, please get in touch. Thanks for listening to the end. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and subscribe and consider sharing with one friend who might enjoy it. If you could leave a review for the podcast, that would be wonderful. The world is indeed a magical place if we choose to step into that perception. And it would be a wise decision. The planet is going through great changes at the moment and it's challenging to stay well mentally and emotionally. I found that allowing time for exercises such as tree connection are massively helpful for well-being. Nature is reaching out a hand to us through these difficult times and it can be our loving support if we allow it to be. Consider again the childlike communion with the world. It is one of love and wonder. Always remain curious.